cock and diaper, sister. Uh, you mind if I play a song? Uh, I'll play the short version. Uh, uh, the kind of guy I am. Marson Provisional Government. It's Goblin Hood time again. Co star in my sight, the amazing suitcase doll, and guest starring our colleague, the Cosmic Weevil doll. We also have some other distinguished members of the Marson Provisional Government here with us tonight, including a very special guest star, the artist, Biotti, creator of Goblin Hood. This is the Frankenstein to Goblin Hood's monster. So this should dispel all those ugly rumors about how Clark Kent and Superman are the same person. <laughs> but in this case, for those of you who are uninitiated, Goblin Hood and Beati are the same person normally. Beati is simply Goblin Hood without the mask. probably wondering if this is going to be part of the prestigious Goblin Hood presidential campaign. Yes, it is, sort of. My running mate, Mary Man, expressed concern that the campaign might be over because of that sleazy little picture upstairs in the uh, spotlight gallery. Whereas actually, by the time I'm done, the campaign will indeed be over in ways that not even Merry Man can imagine. Anyway, I'm glad that the other candidates have gotten down to the dirty politics because Goblin Hood's politics are the dirtiest of them all. Tonight's little escapade is going to be different from most of Beati's junk because there isn't going to be one whole hell of a lot of poetry tonight. But we do have one poem that the artist wants me to perform. I don't even like this poem very much, but Beati wrote all this and he is the boss, so I guess I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> This poem dates back to 1981. The artist published it in his little book, Nightmares for the Yesterday People. But he didn't publish the little tune that goes along with it, so this will be the first time anybody hears what the poem is actually supposed to sound like. I think Beati wanted me to do this because this is the title poem of tonight's production. It was from this that he took the title of this, so we might as well get it over with. The poem, not too surprisingly, is entitled Messianiac, and it goes like this. Messianiac dreamer, messianiac schemer. No one will notice that you're a redeemer. Messianiac monster, messianiac vampire, 
No one will hurt you while you build an empire. You know what you came to say. We'll wait for another day. Take your time. It will be okay, Messianic. When are you coming back? How many prayed for the coming of the Messianic? Messianiac, you are a twisted quack who will be prey for the coming of the Messianiac. No one knows you, Messiah. No one knows. You're a liar. Lead us from frying pans into the fire. Messianiac sniper. Messianiac viper. Act like a snake, but you look like a martyr. You know what you came to say. We'll wait for another day. Take your time. It will be okay, Messianiac. When are you coming back? How many prayed for the coming of the Messianiac? Messianiac, go have a heart attack. Who will be pray for the coming of the Messianiac? Yeah, that wasn't so bad, was it? <laughs> so you're probably wondering, okay, Goblin Hood, what is a messianiac? A messianiac is somebody with extreme delusions of grandeur cosmic delusions, or at least global de delusions. Somebody who believes that they are here to change the world, that they actually have some mandate to change the world, or in some cases, simply somebody that believes that they have the power to change the world. Uh, this often goes along with politicians and people who have power often fall into this kind of syndrome. It's very easy to do. When you have a lot of power, you start thinking you're supposed to be doing all this stuff. Let's see. Jesus, the historic Jesus, if he said and did most of the stuff attributed to him, was probably an early example of a messianiac. Even if he was the son of God, he was still messianiac in terms of his mindset. But you don't have to be particularly religious to get into this. Hitler was something of a messianiac in that he attempted to make great changes in the world. He thought he had some sort of a mandate to do that. After a while, he almost had the power to do that. And Keep in mind that millions of other people bought into the same set of delusions, which is where you know Hitler got his power from. Charles Manson may have been a messianiac. I don't really know of Charles Manson, but certainly the one that was created by the prosecutors 
and the media, the one that was presented to us, uh, was a textbook case of a messianiac, because you'll often find them picking up messages off of Beatles albums and plotting to hop in the dune buggies and tear off to that secret underground cavern beneath the desert once they've started the apocalypse. In fact, starting the apocalypse is a very messianiac kind of thing to do. But perhaps the best modern example we have is the Reverend Jim Jones of Guyana, who was so serious about what he was doing that he wound up committing mass suicide shortly after he uh, shot up the congressional committee that was investigating him. And perhaps this is the difference between a true messianiac and your average garden variety televangelist or something. A lot of those people, I believe, are just charlatans who are in it for the money. Whereas when the messianiac gets caught, instead of going crying off to jail, he or she commits mass suicide. Tonight's specimen is a little bit different than the messianiac proper, because so far we've Basically, perhaps except in the case of Jesus, we've been talking about people who had power, wanted power, enjoyed using power, dug power, okay? Whereas tonight's example, my associate here, doesn't like power. He simply finds himself stuck with it and has spent the bulk of his life trying to get rid of it. But what is it that separates Beati from any of the rest of us? We're about to find out. But for this, we'll need to indulge in a little creative vivisection. see, make the incision right here. <coughs> okay, let's see what we've got here. Aha, uh -huh. one of the artist's lungs. <laughs> An ashtray, not in too terribly good of a shape. But I'm of the opinion that every cafe ashtray performance from now on should incorporate at least one real ashtray. <laughs> what else do we have? This would appear to be the artist's heart. Isn't that sad? His heart seems to be broken. You don't need a PhD in medicine to recognize that this little toy pig is probably the artist's stomach. Aha. Uh -huh. The artist's intestine. The less said, the better, I guess. Still, there's nothing too unusual about any of that. Perhaps the answer lies within the artist's brain. Let's open him up, shall we, and see what he's got in there. the most delicate of incisions for brain surgery, you know. Let's see. I'm trying to get away from me. Not too surprisingly. Okay, in the back we find a reptile of some sort. Very ancient. It appears to be petrified. It's a turtle, but the shell is missing. 
This must be the oldest part of his brain. What else is there? Aha. Uh -huh. The emotions. A bunch of little masks. I bet that's where Goblin Hood came from. Let's see. Aha, uh -huh. okay. The artist's intellect. A horror anthology by H.P. Lovecraft at the Mountains of Madness and Other Tales of Terror. Is that it? I mean, could there be anything really unusual about any of that? Wait a minute, wait. We do have one other thing in here. We have a gun. A device for inflicting harm at a distance. I can't help wondering if everybody has one of these inside their brain. Still, I'm not sure this really tells us very much. One way to understand Biotti would be to uh, study his track record as a performer. In spring of 1991, the artist premiered something here at Acme called Citizen Pain, a science fiction poetry opera. In the course of that production, he staged a full-scale nuclear war which wiped out everybody on the planet except one of his characters who happened to be a genetic mutant immune to radiation poisoning and so forth. That character went to Mars to contact another character known as the Warlock of Mars, a kind of a extraterrestrial magician. And the warlock came back here and then by accident brought everybody back to life, which is why we're all here tonight. Uh, so I guess since it had a happy ending, that wasn't too harmful. But the entire production centered around the death of Biotti's old performance character, my predecessor, Buckethead. And we have with us tonight the mortal remains of Buckethead. Thank you. And I'm sure Bucky thanks you as well. Now, Biotti has tried to deny this. He's tried to put it down to old age or, you know, the bucket being in poor shape. But the fact is, it was Biotti who killed Buckethead. Now, how harmless is that? Moving right along, this harmless artist staged another production on February 1st of this year, and that was the Rabbit Tobacco performance, subtitled The Satanic Ameriflora. That was at Roy G. Biv Gallery. And at least he didn't destroy the world that time. In fact, it started out pretty nice. He had this swell safe sex demonstration, which of course was meant to save lives. But then he had to spoil it all in the second half by committing an act of state-approved violence. And what he did was he convened a war crimes tribunal made up of myself, and the suitcase doll, and the cosmic weevil doll. And we tried Christopher Columbus for crimes against humanity. And we found him guilty of raping and murdering an entire continent for God's glory. 
And then, in the spirit of the Nuremberg trials, we hung him. Now, a good portion of the satanic Ameriflora involved a discussion of occult botany, satanic plants such as parsley, and even more, you know, bizarre things. And so Beati threw in a little gallows humor when he hung Columbus because he hung Columbus in the form of his colleague here, this inflatable doll. Since it's a female doll, ostensibly, you know, he had it wear this a prosthetic penis. And the purpose of all this was a sort of a occult botany experiment, all very scientific. <laughs> the experiment concerned an occult plant, a satanic plant, an overt satanic plant known as mandragora, the mandrake root. The plant grows beneath the gallows. And the reason they believe that is that when you hang a man, he involuntarily ejaculates. The semen rolls down his leg, impregnates the ground, and grows a little satanic plant, a mandrake root. It's supposed to have all sorts of powers. It's also, also supposed to be a drug. Anyway, one thing Beati wanted to do with this little fiasco was to point out the sexual aspects of hanging. And by extension, I think he was trying to say that there's something very sickly erotic involved in all forms of capital punishment. But as for hanging, now, there's a specific syndrome, and I believe it's called erotic asphyxiation, uh, in which people try to choke themselves, suffocate themselves, even hang themselves in order to get their rocks off. <laughs> Beati doesn't suffer from that. He doesn't like being ch He doesn't even like wearing a tie, although he wears one when he wants to do goblin hood, you know, to hold the mask on. Great sacrifice on the part of the artist. But anyway, he does have kind of a sexual, partially sexual fascination for the mechanics of hanging. And he was doing a little more with the Columbus thing than just having a good time. He was actually recreating something that we're going to be talking about. In February of 1960, the Reader's Digest published a condensed novel concerning the conspiracy to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. And even though it wasn't part of the novel, they threw in this swell photograph of the hanging of the Lincoln conspirators. I'm going to be passing this around in a minute so you can all have a look at it. Keep in mind that the person circled in red is Mrs. Surratt. Mrs. Surratt was one of the conspirators. There was a lot of outcry at the time because she was a woman, and it seemed outrageous to hang a woman in public like that. But there was a little more to it than that. Mrs. Surratt hadn't actually done anything except give the conspirators a place to meet. Her son was one of them. Incidentally, he got off scot-free. He fled the country. Booth, as we all know, died before he could go to trial. Mrs. Surratt was hung, supposedly, because she wouldn't talk about the conspiracy. But there was actually something else going on. Many people believe that the Secretary of War was part of the conspiracy. And what makes it even uglier is that the Secretary of War was in charge of the investigation. And one of the things this man did was to get his hands on Booth's diary. Nobody look at it. 
And when he finally gave it up, there were about 20 pages missing. This was the Watergate of its day. Supposedly, there was a deal by which the only way they, the military court would convict Mrs. Surratt was if her sentence was commuted, all right? But it was up to the Secretary of War to get that information to President Johnson, who said he never heard about it. And so Mrs. Surratt was hung with the other conspirators. But Biotti, who was about nine years old when he first saw that, he didn't understand that part. I mean, he vaguely understood that she was kind of like innocent in terms that he could understand. But somehow the fact that it was a woman along with the others seems to glamorize it for the artist. Biotti had two brothers, a father, and his mother. His mother was the only significant woman in his life. And even to this day, women have a kind of a mysterious quality to him. But let's get back to the photograph for a moment. What were the uh, results of this photograph, you might be asking? Biotti took the blocks that he used to play with as a small child and constructed a working model of a gallows. This was virtually the first piece of sculpture that he ever did. And there was even a way to spring the trap on this thing. It was like he would take like a short, stumpy little Lincoln log, right? And use it to prop up this flat block and that's what the little toy soldiers would stand on. And it was surrounded by kind of a well. There were even steps in back made of square blocks. And they were like tall rectangular blocks with a cross piece and a little string. And all he'd have to do is pull that Lincoln log out of there with the string and the trap would fall. And he must have hung hundreds of toy soldiers that way for one crime or another. <laughs> They didn't really need to be guilty of much of anything. There was nobody keeping score. The artist's construction was state of the art. Biotti was also interested in monster movies and fanzines. And uh, he also collected movie monster models, the kind that you'd put together with airplane glue, you know. And there'd be Frankenstein or... Dracula. I suppose these days they'd have Goblin Hood, you know. But one day he went to the store, and this was like years, a couple of years after he started like hanging toy soldiers. He went to the store, and there at the store was a working model of a little plastic guillotine, which was nothing new. I guess the children played with those in Paris during the Revolution. But it comforted the artist a little bit to know that the rest of his society was just as sick as he was. I can't show you what that little toy gallows looked like. They don't make blocks like that anymore. But I can give you a kind of a demonstration. We'll do the best we can here. And again, we'll use my uh, inflatable colleague, who tonight is standing in for none other than yours truly, Goblin Hood. And you have to excuse me here, because this doll doesn't hold air very well. It's been through the mill. And so I'm going to have to like keep reinflating it periodically. If you don't have a real gallows, another good way to do it is to stand on a chair or stand your victim on a chair and then pull the chair out from under them.
since this is ostensibly a female version of those dolls, I guess Goblin Hood is still identifying with Mrs. Surratt. But I have to tell you this. Not a day goes by for Beati, the artist, when he doesn't think of suicide. Usually, it's very temporary thoughts and very immediate, like, God, I wish the earth would fall into the sun. But that one doesn't work too well because that's probably not going to happen. To get any real relief, he has to imagine something that could happen. Hanging is a good one because he knows exactly how to do that. You go to the nearest bridge and tie a rope around the railing and put it around your neck and you jump over the side. Finito. Of course, you have to do it just right or you don't break your neck. You just kind of strangle there for a while. But in his wildest flights of fancy, when the artist's mind is the most free, he's able to envision another war crimes show trial, a trial that would be televised worldwide via satellite, his trial, a trial that he would spend with a noose around his neck, a trial at which the very floor would fall away even as the sentence was passed. He gets a real And I guess the rest of tonight's performance is designed so that you, the audience, can decide whether this messianiac actually deserves a trial like that. Anyway, please join us in just a few minutes for Act Two, which will host the return of the warlock of Mars. from the fourth planet. <laughs> You're probably wondering why the warlock took it upon himself to come back from wherever he disappeared to to preside over Act Two. The reason is that we're going to stray into the realm of the occult. We're going to be talking about magic, religion, and other superstitions, and or the fledgling science of psionic development. <coughs> Biotti was brought up as a Southern Baptist, okay? And before we go on, I'd like to point something out. I'm not here to trash anybody's religion, but I kind of have to find because it's the one he was dealing with. And I guess my general remarks on this subject would be to say that most religions are difficult to understand at best. Beati was probably psychotic when he was very young. At the very least, he was highly imbalanced. So religion wasn't very good for his head. 
but that doesn't mean that he wasn't a believer. He was very much of a believer, but he had a very shaky idea of what the religion was all about. For instance, he would read stuff like the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he would envision God as this monster in the sky, this horrible thing that was so cruel and so vicious that he would create things like the Second World War. And yet, God was always right, too. And Beati couldn't understand that. And nobody could, could explain it to him. At best, they would say things like, Beati, there were some things man was not meant to know. When Beati was capable of believing in Jesus at all, he pictured him as a kind of a zombie who wanted to live inside the artist's heart. And in any case, he was a man. I mean, the whole religion is very masculine. It's not like the Catholics, where they at least have a strong female principle there, even if she is a virgin. You know, in the Southern Baptist Church, the Virgin Mary is a minor character. It's all male-oriented. And Beati was surrounded by males. He was swamped with masculine thought. And he was fascinated by females, but there weren't very many around. But anyway, he never even, it never even occurred to him to worship some other kind of god. So he prayed to this monstrous god a lot, particularly when he was in some sort of trouble, and he was usually in some sort of trouble. But every once in a while, he'd come, a, he'd come across something that what he, he couldn't talk to anybody about, so he didn't really know where things stood. But, for instance, when the artist began to masturbate, it occurred to him that that wasn't the kind of thing God was supposed to approve of and probably wasn't the kind of thing God would have anything to do with and that God wouldn't have anything to do with anybody that did anything like that. And so, unless he wanted to stop doing that, He'd have to, like, give up his religion. Then, too, half the time the prayers didn't work. And he was convinced that God simply hated him because he was evil and God was always right about everything. So, anyway, I have to tell you that Beati reached a point where on alternate days he would, on odd days he would pray to God just on the off chance. And on even days, he would pray to the devil, figuring that the devil probably didn't care about stuff like masturbation. It was sort of weird. And all this was going on inside the artist's head while he played with his little toy gallowses and stuff. Beati had an extremely difficult puberty. Most of his earliest experiences were with other males. And for some reason, one reason or another, they were all uniformly disastrous. So that to this day, he's not real interested in that kind of sex. But I believe he understands it, or he thinks he does. He just, you know, got too much of it at an early age and became too fascinated, anyway, with women, but in a real strange way. He was having a difficult puberty, and he was also having some problems at home. He was having some serious problems with his mother at the time. In February, I can even tell you generally which of two days it was, but I can't tell you the specific date. I can't even tell you the specific year, because every time the artist tries to think about this, his mind gets all 
fuzzy. But it was probably 1964, I believe Kennedy was already dead. It was February and it was either Washington's birthday or Lincoln's birthday. I know that much because Biotti didn't have the day off from school, whereas his father got part of the day off from work. And his parents were planning a automobile excursion to some Amish place to get food, right? For whatever kind of reasons they had. I guess the Amish make great food. <coughs> Biotti got into an argument with his mother on his way to school that day. And while I can tell you what the argument was about, I can't really tell you all of the details. It was actually about something simple. The artist had gotten into the habit of not coming home on the school bus. He hated the school bus. He hated the other kids on the school bus. He was always getting punched in the arm and bullied on the school bus. And besides, he hated being at home. He, he was bullied there, too. And he just wasn't having a very easy time of it, I guess. And he'd gotten into the habit of missing the bus and staying after school. He lived about three miles away from the school. And whenever he did this, his mother would have to come in and get him. You know, and she only just learned to drive, so she didn't relish doing this very much. And he would come up with one stupid excuse after another why he missed the bus this time. But the fact is, he just hated going home. And hanging around the school with his friends after school was about the only sense of freedom he had. So the argument started off about things like that and went into other things, all kinds of things. And I have to point out, this was one of those things where a lot of this stuff was stuff his father presumably didn't know. So that the uh, argument, wait till your father hears about this, I'm going to tell your father was pretty powerful because it usually would uh, be followed by, you know, you'll get sent off to military school or reform school or something, you know. And all of this was real upsetting. A lot of it had to do with sex, it had to do with that unpleasant puberty that he was going through. And a lot of it just had to do with she was sick of going and picking him up after school. And he was sick of going to school, sick of coming home. In some ways, he was sick of being alive. I don't know where his father was. Either he had the whole day off and he was upstairs in bed, or he'd gone to work and he was going to come home, you know, later, and they were going to go, you know, visit the Amish. The argument proceeded for a while, and it was terminated by the arrival of the school bus. Biotti wanted to get in the last word, and so his last word was something like, why don't you drop dead? Why don't you just go to hell? This to his own mother. I don't know what she said, probably you know, an encore about military school, and reform school, a mental hospital. But anyway, he went on out and he got on the bus, ran this gauntlet of people punching him in the arm, sat down and proceeded to worry. And what he was worried about was this. He really didn't want to go home that night. He had a strong suspicion that the argument was not over, that this time the threats might turn out to be real, and that it might have serious repercussions. But he knew better than to try to stay after school this time. The fact is, his real problem was just to get through the day because he kept playing it over in his head. And all he wanted was to be someplace else, to be someone else. And that wasn't going to happen. The 
artist has a problem here with his imagination. And I should point out that for all I know, every single one of you shares this with him. But see, that wouldn't do him any good, would it? The problem he has is that for a daydream to be in any way nourishing, to do him any good, for him to even retain it in his mind, it has to be plausible, something that really could happen, not the earth falling into the sun, but the artist jumping off of a bridge with a noose around his neck. Okay, you see the distinction? The limitations of the imagination. What is a daydream? It's a way to escape from real life. Uh, you would think, looking at the work upstairs, that Biotti has a really strong imagination, right? But the fact is, that's all factual stuff. Most of it is from photographs. Very seldom does he make up anything. Most of his stuff is dead real. So there he is, sitting in school, trying to imagine a way that he could get out of the consequences of that fight. And not too many ways are presenting themselves. But let me give you an example of how this problem works. Uh, like I said, you know, the earth can't fall into the sun. You have to jump off a bridge with a rope around your neck. The example, I think I for a minute. I want to talk about something else first. I want to direct your attention back to the rabbit tobacco performance. We're going to talk about how well adjusted sexually the artist is today, having started out with such a poor beginning. How is he doing now? And I'd like to show you part of the costume that I was wearing for that little presentation. Because this is germane. these plastic pants while him and his doll were scampering around demonstrating safe sex. However, if these things were ever safe, they're not very safe now. <laughs> but I want to direct your attention to the uh, loincloth. Now, he's talked about this before, and he usually gives some bogus reason why he wears it. The real reason, one of the reasons, why he has Goblin Hood wear it is he's trying to keep Goblin Hood sort of androgynous, you know, not of specific gender, to give the impression that Goblin Hood might actually be from another planet, though he has other reasons for that as well. During the rabbit performance, Biotti and his inflatable colleague were scampering about demonstrating the use of things like dental dams and condoms, trying to save lives. <laughs> but I can tell you another condom story about the artist that will indicate exactly what gender he really is. Up until the time he was about 25, Biotti suffered from a disorder 
which is clinically known as enuresis, which translates into bedwetting, okay? And I mean, this was chronic. This was like every night, which has a lot of bearing on the way he felt about himself, the way others felt about him. I mean, here he is running around smelling like piss half the time or all the time. He didn't like to talk about it. He wouldn't even admit it was going on. We have somebody who spent most of his early life in a state of constant denial. It got so serious that when he was in high school, he came up with an experimental palliative treatment for this, which was he would go to bed at night with a condom attached to his penis by means of a rubber band. Sort of like this. Uh, the success of this was variable. Sometimes he'd wake up with a nice little bag of urine all ready to be emptied. Sometimes it would come off in his sleep. Sometimes it would fall apart on his way to the bathroom to empty it. Why did he give this up, you might ask? He gave it up because he was afraid that the rubber band was cutting off the circulation in his penis that it would give him some kind of gangrene and that his penis would fall off. Fortunately, I can testify that the artist still has his penis and that it's still relatively functional. Where was I? Oh yeah, you're probably wondering how he stopped wetting the bed. At the age of 25, he began praying to whatever kind of God it is that he worships to please God, let him stop wetting the bed. You know what? It worked. Now, Goblin Hood is of the opinion that this was all psychosomatic to begin with, and that what was really going on was that when Biotti reached about 25, he was finally away from home for the first time for good. He didn't have to go back there. And so that all those problems and pressures were over with. He didn't have to worry about them anymore. And so he managed to just quit. The fact that it just stopped would indicate there wasn't something physically wrong, although he has a weak bladder to this day. But it's sort of interesting that somebody who prayed so much would wait until he was 25 to pray about something as important as that. And the reason goes back to this plausibility factor. Biotti was afraid to pray for something that he was pretty sure wouldn't happen because he was afraid it wouldn't happen and it would be a serious blow to his faith in whatever kind of god this was. I guess when he was 25, his faith in something was so strong that he was finally willing to test it that way. But by then, he was a lot older, and it also seemed somehow more plausible. Let's go back to the artist sitting in school. Oh, I'd say, I don't know, noon. And he's still trying to figure out some way that his terrible problems could be over with, not just for right now, but forever. Well, the earth could fall into the sun, but that's probably not going to happen. Uh, he could run away from home, but that would probably lead even more directly 
to military school, reform school, an insane asylum, God knows what. He was, in his own way, rational, particularly where his own self-interest was involved. His mother could run away from home. And you know, I think they were talking about divorce. I'm not sure. But that probably wasn't going to happen. He finally thought up something that could, in fact, happen and began to fixate on that all day long. But I want to tell you just how strong this is, this necessity to be plausible about things. And let's go back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is masturbation. And Beati started doing that. I don't know how old he was, but it's interesting because he started thinking somehow that this was going to make him stop wetting the bed. Kind of crazy, huh? Well, it didn't, but he enjoyed it. It was one of the few things he did enjoy, so he kept doing it, no matter what God thought. He kept doing it, but he noticed very early on that for somebody like him, it presents certain problems. Now, let's leave out the subject of pornography, okay? Beati's very visually oriented, so dirty pictures kind of do it for him. And the reason they do is because you don't have to think about them. I mean, everything's already there. You know, it stimulates you and that. But suppose he's just lying on his mattress in the corner of his room. He wants to get his rocks off because he's been doing this for so long he can't even sleep unless he gets his rocks off, right? How do you start? You start lying there in the darkness with a mental fantasy of some sort. But now let's figure in his condition, that this has to be something plausible. What that means is that he can't just pick anybody out and imagine crooking his finger and they hop into bed. That's not going to happen. What's worse is that the things the artist wants aren't particularly normal things. So it makes it that much more difficult. And since I'm being so upfront with you about Biotti's problems, what, do, what exactly does he want? Well, interestingly, in view of his earlier uh, orientation, Biotti is fixated upon acts of sodomy with women, mutual sodomy, okay? And what's neat about that is since the woman would be using some artificial device, he can do that all by himself, and it feels exactly the same. So, not a lot of women are real interested in that kind of stuff in his experience, though he's not, you know, any kind of an expert on this subject. But here he is, trying to imagine something happening. And first off the bat, he comes up against a taboo. The taboo is that he strongly doesn't believe in rape. He doesn't believe in coercion of any kind. He doesn't even believe in heavy persuasion. In other words, even in his imagination, if she's going to bed with him, it's got to be because she really wants to. So he has to start trying to imagine reasons why she would want to, which is really hard to imagine. He can imagine himself getting rich, but gee whiz, is that ever a sidetrack? By the time that happens, he's asleep, you know? He can imagine her falling in love with him, but you know, that's really hard to imagine for him. Sometimes I think he doesn't even love himself. Sometimes I think he doesn't even love me. But he has to be 
totally plausible. It has to be something that could really happen, somebody that would really be doing it. And by the time he comes to like the point where he could actually start getting anything out of this, they're practically married. And again, he's almost asleep. Now, one thing he could do is fall back on past experiences and think about that. And he does, although there's a problem there, too. Most of his relationships have been really unhappy for both parties. And so to think about sex in that sense carries like this emotional baggage with it that just makes it not worthwhile, although he finds himself doing it when he has to. But he's evolved a way to do this that makes him excited, first of all, and that also solves some of those problems. Because for one thing, he can imagine a woman enjoying what he's doing if he's doing it to himself and he enjoys it, right? To illustrate this, I'm going to need the uh, good offices of my friend here once again. You are about to see Biotti and his creation actually get it on. Okay, so here we have Dr. Frankenstein and his monster. Wait, I forgot one thing. Remember that Biotti is, after all, technically male. No matter what he's imagining himself to be. this is there doesn't have to be any foreplay they don't even have to get together for drinks they're both just already there and so let's see Biotti's actually lying on a mattress. This is all very symbolic here. First of all, he'd use a little bit of lubricant. Like that. Notice that he doesn't use the batteries in this thing. Just for show. That's the girly boy way to do it. <laughs> so he inserts it, kind of squirms around on it, moves back and forth, you know. And 
then for the rest of it, he just pulls his wire, beats his me. You know the drill. You know how it works. So we'll leave him to that. And we'll go see what's happening over here. The artist has come up with a plausible daydream. His mother could always get killed in a car accident. After all, they are on their way to visit the Amish people and buy food, and it's a lousy, rainy, snowy day out there. So, there he is, sitting in shop class. He's been daydreaming about this for a couple of hours, that maybe she'll just get killed in a car accident. Maybe I'll go home and she'll be dead. And the principal shows up. And Beati wonders, oh my God, what have I done now? Because, true enough, he's singled out. You're coming with me, boy. So he goes outside the shop class, and much to his surprise, his two brothers are there. And that's when he knows this isn't a normal fiasco by any means. Meanwhile, over here, the artist finally reaches some sort of a wheezy little climax and ejaculates onto this old rag. <laughs> like that. While over here, the principal tells Beati that his mother has just been thrown through the windshield of a car. A sad tale. About a year before his mother died, Beati started smoking. And since he had to steal most of his cigarettes from her, she found out about it. And she asked him to quit. And somehow, this was when they were still getting along, he managed to quit. He'd been doing it for about six weeks. I mean, he was, or six months, OK? He was addicted. But he didn't realize that. He didn't even know what that meant. And he managed to quit for about six months until after his mother died. He smoked about half a cigarette on the day of her funeral and then tried to quit again, but it was just no use. Cigarettes go with tragedy like a fine wine. And so about two weeks after they put her in the ground, the artist started smoking again. And he's been smoking upwards of four packs a day ever since. And they also go well with sex. So the second thing he does after he gets his rocks off is to light up a cigarette. The first thing he does is to take this sleazy little scum rag and stash it between the wall and the mattress side. Please join us after another costume change for in which we'll see if a story like this can, in fact, have a happy ending.
This costume is called the Newer Monster for reasons I'm not even going to bother to go into. <coughs> probably wondering about my mask, are you? Come on, admit it. You're wondering what this story is on that mask. This is Goblin Hood's mask, but the mask has its own name. The name of the mask is Saint Spider Day of the Ants. This dates back to an experience that Biotti had in 1969 towards the end of the uh, hippie era. You remember when there was all those drugs around? And his earliest drug experiences were with homemade kinds of things like airplane glue. But one day he got picked up hitchhiking and somebody told him about a drug that was more powerful than LSD. They said you could get so high on this drug that you could talk to dead people. And Biotti took it into his head to try and use the drug and see if he could contact his dead mother. Basically, he just wanted to say he was sorry. <coughs> well, he didn't get quite that high. I'm not going to tell you what the drug is. I mean, I don't know if you could still get it over the, over the counter or not. At the time, he had to lie a little bit to get it, but he didn't need a prescription. I will tell you, one of the active ingredients, though, was belladonna, another satanic plant. All the enchanters, nightshade. And it's a powerful delirium. And what it did was this. First, it knocked him out. And he took a big dose of this stuff, which is real scummy and hard to swallow. He drank the stuff, he passed out, and when he woke up, everything seemed to be crawling with spiders. The drug has an effect very similar to delirium tremens, I'm told. It also dilates your pupils so much that if we even look at a shadow on the wall, or say those little red streaks over there, right? They would seem to be moving. They would either look like worms or columns of insects moving. In his case, spiders. The artist was terrified of spiders. Fortunately enough for him, he survived this drug. I'm told it can blind you. I'm told it can also kill you in which case you really would find yourself talking to dead people, I guess. <laughs> but what happened to him is he woke up the next day kind of seeing two of everything, but slowly got his act back together. Why is he called Saint Spider Day of the Ants? Well, I'll tell you why he's called Saint Spider Day in a little while. But I can tell you right now why he's called Saint Spider Day of the Ants. Jolly old Saint Spider Day was last seen playing with ants on the sidewalk. Millions of them, or at least thousands of them, swarming around, having ant wars or mass mating rituals or whatever it is that they do down there on the sidewalk. I'm sure you've seen them there, you know. And Spider Day would pick up a small leafy branch, basically a twig, and just kind of brush a few thousand of them off to the side. He wanted to see what they would do, and he also wanted to see if they would seem to be aware of his vast power over them. However, they didn't seem to notice at all. But that is why he became known as Saint Spider Day of the ants. I also have a goblin hood story to tell you. I once lived in an apartment where I would sometimes have mice or possibly even rats. It wasn't exactly infested. I believe they would just pass through this place when the weather was cold. 
I didn't want to deal with rat traps, so I would leave out rat poison. And they would scarf it down and clamor for more. And then they would go sneaking off into the walls to die. I never found very many of their bodies. And so I knew that they were there smirking at me, dying inside the walls where I couldn't reach them, having the last laugh. And when summer came, and summer does come, I would keep my doors and windows closed most of the time because that's the kind of goblin hood I am. But no matter what I did, at some point, the apartment would fill up with flies, big, fat, lazy flies. And I'd wonder where they came from, and then it would hit me. It was the rats, the rats in the walls, those fucking rats still smirking at me, rotting in there, breeding maggots, which would turn into these big, fat, lazy flies. And goblin hood would make a point out of trying to take these flies out via personal combat. He'd set up a light source and then turn all the other lights off. And when these stupid flies would fly to the light, he'd smush them between his fingers. He felt responsible for them. I felt responsible for them because I knew I had created these flies through my actions. I was their creator. These were my flies. I was the lord of the flies. As for Beati, following the untimely death of his mother, the artist went into another heavy state of denial. Now, he could tell you virtually everything about the incident. He just couldn't tell you how he had felt about it at the time or what he'd been thinking that day or any of that. He usually focused on the argument, you know, because that was a lesser evil. Oh, I told my mother to drop dead. I told my mother to go to hell. Too bad but, you know, not something to feel too terribly guilty about, I guess. And yet, he was beginning to subconsciously suspect the beginning of something that he has since termed the Beati Syndrome. And the next major incidence of the Beati Syndrome began in 1973, in spring of 1973. The artist had not started painting yet. He hadn't started the paintings that would make him relatively well known now. At the time, he wanted to be a cartoonist, an underground cartoonist. So he was doing a lot of drawing. And him and a colleague by the name of Bruce Sobel Another, cartoon, another fledgling would-be cartoonist, basically, got together and published a small book of drawings and cartoons entitled Mindscapes. That's Beati's work on the cover. Every other page was by his friend Bruce. But on the inside back, Cover, we have this. And I have uh, enlarged this panel because I want you to see it. I'm going to pass this around. I want you to take a look at it. Keep in mind that this was published in spring, March of 1973, the Vietnam War was freshly over. Watergate had started, but it was still looking like the president would stonewall it. And yet, Viotti published his cartoon, and he had a joke newspaper in the cartoon. And the joke headline of the joke newspaper was, Nixon quits 
which seemed at the time like a big joke. We all know that that's actually what happened, but it didn't happen for over a year. Some would say this was a coincidence. Some would say that this was simply an example of some fledgling form of, uh, what is the word? <coughs> Prophecy. Prophecy, that's one word, yeah, yeah. I wanted something a little more scientific, but prophecy will do it. Yes, he prophesied the uh, end of the Nixon administration. But then, at the end of that year, toward the end of 1973, he began working on a painting called The Knife is the Color of Time. And this was specifically supposed to be an exorcism this was the first time the artist dabbled in exorcism. As a special treat, he went to Washington, D.C. with a friend over a weekend. So he was actually there at the heart of the problem, since that president wasn't going to be coming to Ameriflora to be exorcised. And then later on, the next year, Biotti had a bad day. Very bad day. He had a really bad toothache. So he went to the doctor, and he got his tooth pulled. And then he went home and watched the president resign on television. Coincidence or what? It's up to you to decide. <laughs> Getting back to the Biotti syndrome, as if we ever really lost it, left it. I didn't think too much about his mother's death until New Year's Eve of 1975. He had begun painting by then, and his paintings took the form of autotherapy. He would draw a picture that somehow related to whatever was in his mind, and then he would slowly, over a long period of time, usually months long, he would fill it in with paint. And he decided, he realized that something about his mother was bothering him, so he decided that he wanted to explore that situation once and for all, and that on New Year's Eve of 1975, he would do a painting that would talk about it. If you ever get a chance to see any of my colleagues' exhibits, that painting was entitled Basket Case. It worked. It was finished by the next morning. The drawing was finished. But the artist was completely out of his mind by the next morning. And even though it was New Year's Eve, he was relatively drug-free, you know? He didn't get this way on drugs. He just kind of flipped out because he's looking at the situation, facing it, and can't face the fact that he believes this. He believes he did that to his mother. He came up with a way out of his problems, and he took that way out of his problems. Let's remember that he was brought up in a culture where most of our problems are solved by rubbing somebody out. Biotti went wandering around for about two weeks, completely insane. And I mean, not just psychotic. Just if he'd been caught doing half the things he was doing, he probably would have been locked up. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't do anything really bad. He just did crazy things. He couldn't figure out who or what he was. His whole past seemed to melt away. He believed he was God. After a while, he started believing he was the devil. Then he started believing that he was Jesus Christ. And then he started believing that he was the Antichrist. And then he started to believe that he was all four of them. To believe that. To believe that there was no other way it could be. And let me give you an example of the kind of things he did. He had a bunch of little pet hermit crabs, actually two pet hermit crabs, that a friend had given him. And these crabs were his pride and joy. He honestly liked them, okay? He liked them so much that he decided they probably didn't enjoy being in captivity. Now, this was January, 
For a while, it was very seasonable. The artist decided to free the crabs. So he took them from his cruddy little basement apartment in a paper bag, and he set them loose on the banks of the Olentangy River. He believed that that action, that symbolic ritual action, would turn the entire universe into a tropical paradise just for his little hermit crabs. It wasn't that warm out. I sincerely doubt that they even survived the trip down to the river. And it froze that night. The temperature suddenly dropped, and everything was covered with ice. So he was never able to go back and find out how the crabs were doing. Anyway, that's the kind of psychotic episode that he was having early in 1975. He finally got out of this dilemma by hanging around with other people, picking out people that he thought were sort of normal, and studying them, trying to act as much like they do as possible, which isn't always a good idea, but sometimes it's the best you can do. Following his return to something like normalcy, the artist continued painting, and his paintings became more and more realistic. He didn't finish the basket case painting for almost two years. He couldn't think about it, didn't want to think about it. By the time he started working on it again, he'd become kind of jaded about it, so he was able to finish it in six. So I guess it was about one year. He was thinking very strongly about what was going on. Did he believe this thing about his mother or not? And what's more, did he believe the thing about Richard Nixon or not? He believed in the Beati syndrome, believed that he was cursed with this, some form of telekinesis, okay? And there didn't seem to be any limits on it because the business with Nixon was a world-shaking event. Biotti was slowly becoming human. He'd stopped wetting the bed. He actually dates his life from that point. He was trying to figure out how to be more human. One thing that, he, that had occurred to him that was that he was extremely cold-blooded, extremely cold-hearted, and he wanted to figure out ways of loving the human race. Some of his best paintings were done during this period while he studied the problem, but it wasn't for a long time that he stopped trying to figure out how to control the Beati syndrome. In other words, how to sit here and do just the right things with your hermit crabs that will make the universe do what you want. Essentially, he was studying power. <clears throat> In late summer of 1986, the artist fell into a crisis. Uh, he began to, well, I guess I have to do some background here. Back when Biotti was hanging toy soldiers and reading a lot of monster magazines and building monster models and stuff, he began reading the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft was the successor to Poe. And from his early childhood, Biotti regarded him as one of the best modern horror story writers, and still does to this day. Uh, in fact, he went out and after he went to college, he went out and bought paperbacks of all of Lovecraft's work and read them to shreds. 
And even now, he goes to the library once or twice a year, gets as many Lovecraft books as he can, takes them home, and reads them over again. He's also read the uh, writer's biography. Lovecraft wasn't a very pleasant individual in some ways, but he did have one thing that Beatty identified quite strongly with. He was a recluse, very much of a loner. And for most of his life, Beatty has been that as well. Let me tell you about Lovecraft's work, though. He created something called the Cthulhu mythos. Cthulhu was this big monster, gigantic, with tentacles growing out of his face. He was one of the old ones, sometimes known as the ancient ones, sometimes known as the elder gods. The Cthulhu mythos was basically a series of vaguely related stories. They made Lovecraft famous. He is famous for creating this mythology. And he invited his friends and other writers who admired the work to contribute to the mythos so that even after he died, at a fairly young age, other people were still writing Cthulhu stories, and they still are to this day. It's becoming a big industry. There's movies, there's even a popular role-playing game based on the Cthulhu mythos. It was always Beati's ambition to contribute something to the mythos. Let me explain something about the mythology here. In Lovecraft's stories, usually some overreacher, you know, some... Sometimes they were evil people, sometimes they were just misguided, and they would get their hands on forbidden books and meddle with things that they shouldn't have meddled with. The most popular of the forbidden books was something Lovecraft made up, and it was called the Necronomicon. He made up an entire genealogy for this book. It was written by the mad Arab, Abdul Alhazred. And he had this whole list of printings that it had been through, but it would always be suppressed, burned. There were about six copies in the world, and they were all kept closely under lock and key at world-famous libraries, particularly the library of Miskatonic University, which Lovecraft also made up. Being that this is a major industry by now, it's not too surprising that somebody would come along and cash in on that by actually writing a version of the Necronomicon. which we have with us tonight, a forbidden book. Last time I checked the computer, they have something like eight copies of this in the main library, accessible to the public. Now, even in 1986, Beatty wasn't stupid enough to mistake this for the real thing. He realized that it was just somebody's scam but it reads as if it could be the real thing or something. And he decided to pretend that it was the real thing because it gave him a chance to participate in the Cthulhu mythos at last. Another feature of the mythos was that while all this stuff was going on, Lovecraft would have his characters slowly find out the reality of these ancient gods. And he would throw in things like Stonehenge and the heads on Easter Island. And these were always cited as evidence of the old ones. Well, in 1976, right about the time the joined the human race, we sent a Viking probe to the planet Mars. And it sent us back photographs of what looked like a big head like a mile across. And that these days, they even think there might be some sort of a city there, ruins of a city. It's com come to be known as the Martian Sphinx. And so, Beatty figured 
he would do this. He would contribute to the mythos by incorporating the Marcin Sphinx into the mythos by means of a painting. And this copy of the Necronomicon made it real easy for him to do because there's actually a monster or a god or a demon or something in here that's associated with Mars. The god of Mars is the mighty Nurgle. He has the head of a man on the body of a lion and bears a sword and a flail. He is the god of war and of the fortunes of war. He was sometimes thought to be an agent of the ancient ones, for he dwelt in Kutha for a time. His color is dark red. His essence is to be found in iron and all weapons and so forth and so on. This is his seal. And this is his gate, an interdimensional gate by which one might let the old ones through from their dimension. The old ones supposedly ruled here before we ever showed up. According to some parts of the mythos, they created us, but it was some kind of an accident. Their biggest ambition, they were banished. Cthulhu, for instance, was forced to go live under the ocean in this sunken city. And until some misguided magician lets him go with the right spells or until the stars are right, he has to stay there. So the mythos has rules. But basically, the old ones want to come through from their dimension and people like Biati to affect that. This is the painting that got Biati kicked out of the Einsteinian space-time continuum. <laughs> you can see that he's incorporated the Martian Sphinx. He's also incorporated an early version of his conception of the Martian Zonai, Nurgle. Nurgle, by the way, actually figures in ancient Babylonian uh, mythology, some kind of a demon, sort of on the order of Beelzebub. That's the way Biati conceptualizes Nurgle today. Please notice that the gate is open in this painting. If you go back upstairs and check Biati's latest work, the gate is closed. For a couple of years after this was done, the artist felt himself haunted. And if you had lived as miserable of a life as he has, you'd know that that really takes something. For somebody whose life is hell anyway to suddenly become more hellish and in a very pointed fashion. Well, I can't tell you the kind of things that were happening because they wouldn't really make sense to you. They made sense to him. He felt like he was possessed by a demon. And he had this problem, which goes back to the Biotti syndrome. First of all, Biotti had long been haunted by another idea which was that during the notorious Spider Day affair, he may have actually damaged the universe. He was pretty certain that he had, in fact, damaged his brain. But he wasn't sure whether when he woke up the next day and everything was back to normal, everything was back to normal the way it should be, or whether it was all messed up because of what he had done. Tell you the too sure about that. But at this point, he believed he was possessed by this demon. He had become a part of the mythos. And that created a real problem because Biati also believed that his power was growing and he'd never had any real control over it. It was always very convoluted. Things like the Nixon affair were not 
the average thing. Usually he would try to do something like he did with the hermit crabs and it wouldn't work. It would be a total flop. In fact, everything would freeze over that night. But he really began to worry because of this Marson connection. He didn't care if he was being manipulated by ancient entities from the planet Mars, but he did care if they used him to bring about the end of the world. And he was having a lot of other troubles at the time, and he finally learned something. What he'd learned is that he didn't want to be a messianiac. He didn't want to be what he was. He wanted to be a harmless artist, somebody who affects little changes a little bit at a time as he goes along, painting pictures, and they're supposed to influence you, and you're supposed to go out there and influence somebody else and creating ripples. He didn't want to be pulling the big lever to ching for every presidential election. He just wants to pull the little lever. And he doesn't give a damn who wins, who loses. He decided he had to get rid of the power, but that wasn't as easily said, or it wasn't as easily done as it was to say. Great power has a way of sticking to the people that have it. But he had finally decided that he didn't want it. In other words, he decided he wanted all of you to have free will. And that's how Spider Day became known as Saint Spider Day. <laughs> Early in 1988, Biotti began painting his celebration. This was the one that got sent to Alaska for the big censorship symposium. It's probably his most popular piece to date. And he did a lot of research for that. And the painting is steeped in occult history. And one thing that he learned, you know, trudging back and forth from the library with books on the occult was that in the occult, the symbol represents whatever power it represents. The symbol is the power. And if you think about it for a minute, it has to be that way. Otherwise, these warlocks drawing pentagrams and stuff on the floor so they can stand inside of them and invoke demons, that wouldn't do any good if the symbol itself didn't contain the power that it represents. So. While he was in the early stages of that painting, Biotti created a symbol for his Biotti syndrome power. That symbol, the yellow sign. And what this was going to do, it was going to represent the power. It was going to give him control over the power. He was going to finally be able to do whatever he wanted with the power to do it directly, thought made real. And what he did with it was he decided to use it directly, purposefully, for the first time, and turn it off. So he used his power to turn his power off. Uh, I guess in psychiatric circles, this would be like using your insanity to treat your insanity. The problem is that you can't really turn it, make it go away. You can turn it off. But if he makes the power go away, paradoxically, uh, he doesn't have the power to make it go away. You know, so it comes back. So he's still stuck with this. Every time he uses the symbol, which he's taken to calling the Marson harmless art symbol, he says it's written in Marson, uh, it means that he's not doing anything but whatever it looks like he's doing. In this case, painting a picture. You know, He doesn't want to have any further effect than that. As for the demon, Nurgle, 
uh, obviously he couldn't get around this symbol, even if he's still there, although Biotti would be pretty putrid meat by now, not having any power to play with. Even if he's still there, uh, he's basically impotent because Biotti has rendered himself, if not impotent, then harmless. We all know that Nurgle is actually the latest mask for what Biotti has been dealing with. Before we stop tonight, I'd like to answer a question that I raised in one of my paintings upstairs. The question was about my uh, lingerie performance a while back. And I'm going to recreate part of that performance for you tonight. <coughs> Some sweet stuff. Huh? <laughs> Let's see. Now, the interesting thing about this performance was that Biotti, this was one of the first things he ever composed, this lingerie poem. But he didn't do it for 14 years because he was afraid of it. He was afraid of what it was saying. And when he did premiere this, it was uh, toward the end of an event called Queens of Columbus, Performance and the Art of Illusion, which was a world premiere of a video. And there were live performances by the video stars. And Biotti came on last and did this. And at the time, he created a little science fiction story to go with it because he still felt uncomfortable about it. He didn't want to just break it out because of what it was saying. It was so megalomaniac. <laughs> but he created a kind of a dystopian world where people were being pushed around and a world so grim and ugly, even worse than this one, that everybody would probably be better off dead. Everybody in the planet was probably wishing the Earth would fall into the sun. And he had this alien, okay, who was in contact with a spaceship. And the alien's name was Lanzare. And his people were called the Lanzare. And they lived on a planet somewhere called Lanzare. And this was sort of based on the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The alien was about to get rounded up, primarily because of the way he dresses. And so he decided to send a message to his ship, which was pointing a death ray at the planet. And his message was in the form of a little song. And the song was called <coughs> Lingerie. Lingerie, 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 lingerie. In the night, my pretty lingerie, lingerie. Lingerie, lingerie, in the night, my sexy lingerie, 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 in the night, lingerie, malicious lingerie. Lingerie, lingerie, in the night, lingerie, repressive lingerie, sadistic lingerie, 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 lingerie. Lingerie, lingerie, lingerie in the night.
to launch your ray and blow us all away. Launch your ray, launch your ray, launch your ray, my children of the night. Launch your ray, launch your ray, mes enfants de la nuit. Launch your ray, launch your ray, my children, children of the night. Launch your ray, everybody, launch your ray. Lingerie, 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 lingerie. <laughs> bravo, bravo, mes enfants de la nuit. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a snicker. <laughs> Following his swell performance of Lanzure, Goblin Hood gave his audience with one last anecdote about Biotti's mother. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Biotti remembered his mother crying beside the radio, trying to explain to him the end of the world. Then Goblin Hood told about Biotti's last act of office as an official messianiac, just before he implemented his harmlessness sigil, Biotti was forced to choose for himself between two futures, one in which there were nuclear war and one in which there were only conventional war. He couldn't opt for a world without war because his choice had to be plausible. He compared a non-nuclear future to George Orwell's book, 1984, but he chose this path anyway, reasoning that as long as the human race existed, it might plausibly change someday but that nuclear war eliminated the possibility of change. Still, Goblin Hood, now in charge of the harmless Martian Sigil, very democratically offered his audience a chance to vote on the subject. No hands were raised in favor of nuclear war, which gave Goblin Hood the chance to blame whatever happened in the future on everybody else, which he would have done anyway.
This epilogue was taped in the spotlight gallery of the Acme Art Company, where during October of 1992, the artist Biotti had a show entitled Myths of the Dream State, featuring paintings about the Goblin